السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you so much for providing the opportunity to present this lecture about the biomechanics of total knee arthroplasty. The aim of this lecture is to define how the motion of the knee joint and the forces acting on it can affect the function and the durability of TKA components by influencing the surgical techniques and the implant design. Learning objectives to define the anatomical structures that are relevant to TKA biomechanics, determine the biomechanical aspects necessary for a successful TKA, which are the appropriate alignment, correct knee joint kinematics, and the proper patellofemoral tracking. Last thing to describe the TKA and blunt constraining options according to the biomechanical aspect. The main difference between the hip and knee joints is the absence of inherent stability of the knee contrary to the pole and socket hip joint. So the knee joint needs structures and forces to keep its stability during stance and motion. These structures include the bone geometry, ligaments and the capsule, which are non-contractile static structures, muscles and tendons, which are the dynamic contractile structures, and the menisci. To start with the bone geometry of the femoral condyles, the medial condyle has a large uniform radius of curvature, larger than the lateral condyle, that extends to uh, lower distal and posterior levels. This uh, extension is responsible for the femoral inclination. Contrary to that is the lateral femoral condyle, which has a smaller radius of curvature. This curvature is distinguished into two unequal curves, and lastly, the intercondylar notch. For the tibial plateau, the medial side is similar to its femoral counterpart, so it is large, circular, and concave to accommodate for the larger medial femoral condyle. This structure is acting as a pivot for the screw home mechanism and knee stability. Whereas the lateral plateau is more or less convex to flat and smaller oval in shape for sliding motion of the lateral femoral condyle. The orientation of the tibia plateau with the shaft has a posteriorly direct slope of 7 to 9 degrees. The patellofemoral joint is a planar gliding joint with in sole salvati ratio to detect the patellar position, either normal or lowered patella baja or elevated patella alta. The static stabilizers of the knee include the medial collateral ligament, which extends from the medial epicondyle into superficial part longer and extends to the upper third of the tibia with two kinematically distinguished portion anterior and posterior and a deeper shorter that fuses with the capsule and menisci. This ligament is a primary restraint against valgus stresses. On the lateral side, the lateral collateral ligament that extends from the lateral condyle to the fibular head and it is separated from the lateral meniscus by the popliteus tendon and the capsule. This ligament is a primary restraint to varus stress and secondary restraint to external rotation and posterior tibial. The anterior crochet ligament is either torn during the course of osteoarthritis disease or will be torn during preparation of TKA. The posterior crochet is of more concern. It is a primary stabilizer in posterior tibial translation and during flexion of the knee, it becomes tense to a degree that prevents initial rolling of the femoral condyles and changing it to a sliding motion, which is known as rollback of the femoral condyles. Finally, it is a secondary stabilizer together with the posterior capsule against various and valgus stresses after ligament release. Dynamic stabilizers of the knee include the tendons and muscles, which are the quadriceps and its four parts. On the medial side, the semimembranous muscle and other muscles. On the lateral side, the popliteus tendon complex and the iliotibial tract and others. The menisci also share to the kinematics of the knee, with the medial meniscus C-shaped and larger, and fixed to the capsule, allowing for pivoting function of the medial side, while the lateral meniscus is circular, more mobile for more motion of the lateral condyle, and has relations to the posterior crochet ligament by meniscofemoral ligaments, ligament of Risberg and ligament of Humphrey. The lateral meniscus is separated from the lateral collateral ligament by popliteus. 
after review of the relevant anatomical features to TKA, we will discuss the important target that to get a successful TKA. First is to restore neutral non-deviated mechanical alignment in order to get even distribution of stresses over the replaced joint. Second, to align ligament in a balanced situation without tightness during flexion or extension. Also, to restore the joint line for proper patellar position and flexion. And last thing is to obtain normal Q angle for patellofemoral stability and proper patellofemoral tracking. Neutral alignment of the limb is obtained if a line drawn from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle joint will pass through the center of the knee. Due to inclination of the femoral bone, it has two axes, the mechanical one from the center of the femoral head to the knee center, but another anatomical one, this line bisects the medullary canal of the femur. The difference between these two axes is 5 to 7 degrees in a valgus orientation. The anatomic axis of the femur also demarcates the entry point for the intramedullary femoral guide and the cutting jigs. To allow for proper distribution of body weight stresses, we need the femoral implant to be perpendicular to the mechanical axis. But our intramedullary alignment guides are using the anatomical axis to compensate for such a difference. A 5 to 7 degrees valgus orientation cut is made to obtain the alignment needed. This is known as the valgus cut angle, which is perpendicular to the mechanical uh, axis of the femur. This photo shows the relations between the intramedullary guide towards the anatomical axis and the cutting box towards the mechanical axis. For the tibia, the two axes are identical in an undeformed tibia. Two tibial cut is made perpendicular to the anatomical axis, which is perpendicular to the med, uh, mechanical axis as well. Another alignment of TKA component is a rotatory alignment. The native knee has a 3 degrees of vars. The tibial cut will be made in a perpendicular position to the anatomical axis, leading to a difference between the medial and lateral sides of the joint, which is referred as the trapezoidal gap. But this gap is not good enough and leads to unbalanced flexion gap with difference between the medial and lateral sides and unstable patella with subluxation tendency of the patellofemoral joint. To compensate for such a gap, external rotation of the anteroposterior cut of the femur is made to allow for a rectangular balanced gap. This external rotation is made by 3 degrees, which corresponds to the native 3 degrees of force of knee. Methods to detect proper rotation either perpendicular to the anteroposterior axis white side line of the femur or along the epicondylar axis or 3 degrees external rotation in relation to the posterior condylar axis. Here it comes the kinematics of the knee joint. The knee joint is a modified hinge joint with 6 degrees of freedom or 6 directions of motions, 3 translational motions of mediolateral, proximodistal and anteroposterior drawer motions, and three rotational motions around axes for flexion extension, internal external rotation, and various valgus motion. For flexion extension movement, the axis of rotation is helical in shape and not a fixed point. This instant center moves posteriorly during flexion of the knee in unequal situation, where posterior translation of the femoral condyle on the medial side is only 2 mm and on the lateral side is 21 mm. This unequal translation is responsible for two phenomena, the posterior rollback and screw home mechanism. Posterior rollback of the femur is a function of the posterior crochet ligament, which is tense during flexion, and also the geometry of both the tibial and the femoral articulating surfaces. Femoral rollback is defined as change of the contact points between the femur and tibia during flexion, due to combined rolling and sliding. If rolling is the only motion, then impingement occurs posteriorly with premature termination of flexion at 100 degrees only. But with more flexion, PCL tension occurs, leading to dragging of the femoral condyles over the tibial condyle, changing the contact points and allow for more flexion up to 130 degrees without impingement. 
The same principle of pivoting of the medial side and sliding of lateral side accounts for the screw home mechanism, allowing for internal rotation of the lateral condyle during full extension, locking a knee, the knee in a solid column, and reverse occur with unlocking of the joint by external rotation of the femur by the action of the popliteus tendon. The final part of kinematics is about the patellofemoral tracking that depends on a correct Q angle as increased Q angle leads to a tendency of patellar subluxation and maltracking. Increased Q angle could happen with femoral component internal rotation and medialization leaving the patella incompletely supported. The same situation can happen with internal rotation of the tibial component or lateralization of the patellar component. The rotatory alignment of the femoral component was mentioned before. For the tibial component, it should be centralized that the center of the tibial implant is placed over the medial one-third of the tibial tubercle. If the tibial component is internally rotated, this will be translated after reduction of the joint into external rotation of the tibia with subsequent subluxation and the maltracking of the patellofemoral joint. For the patellar component, it should be medialized or centralized, but not in a lateralized position, as this lateralized will increase Q angle and patellar maltracking can eventually be presented. To summarize the cuts of the TKA, the first cut is a tibial cut, which is perpendicular to the anatomic axis of the tibia. The second cut is a distal femoral cut, which is 5 to 7 degrees valgus to the anatomic axis of the femur. Making these cuts in this orientation will bring them in a perpendicular position to the mechanical axis of the limb. Third and fourth cuts are anterior and posterior femoral cuts and will be made in a 3 degrees of external rotation, making a rectangular flexion gap, a balanced gap. Five and six cuts are the anterior and posterior chamfer cuts. And the seventh cut is a patellar cut, will be in a medialized position. Mechanical constraining of TK implants is an application for studying of the knee joints biomechanics, which is defined as the pattern of implant design that provides the stability needed to counteract forces around the knee in the presence of deficient soft tissue tension or inadequate bone support. So if more deformity is present with soft tissue release is needed or in presence of soft tissue deficiency, this needs more constraining, which is the linkage between the femoral and tibial parts. Three types of constraining devices are presented, non-constrained, constrained, non-hinged, and hinged devices. The first type is a non-constrained device, which are the most commonly used. There is no linkage between the femoral and tibial parts and the stability of the implant depends on the patient's own ligaments and muscles. Crochet retaining variety where the ACL ligament is removed while the PCL is kept. Less bone is removed from the femoral side with better proprioception and the femoral rollback mechanism depends on intact posterior crochet ligament over a flat tibial polyethylene. Nevertheless, if the PCL is inflamed adding rheumatoid arthritis, tightness of the ligament can lead to increased polyethylene wear and the anterior lift of the tibial insert during knee flexion. Also, late rupture of the BCL ligament could occur with joint instability. To overcome these problems, a second type of non-constrained TK implants can be used, which is a crochet sacrificing implant, as in posterior stabilized design. Both the ACL and BCL ligaments are removed, in which a femoral cam transversely Ill presented connects between both femoral condyles, engages a tibial polyethylene post during flexion. Rollback mechanism depends on the cam and post contact. So it can be used in inflammatory osteoarthritis as in rheumatoid arthritis with defective BCL. Also can be used in patellectomy cases where the knee envelope is weak. But nothing goes without expense as these implants have their own problems. One of these is a cam jump with anterior dislocation of the cam over the bust. If the flexion gap is loose, the second complication is wear of the polyethylene bust. 
and last one is patellar clunk syndrome where a fibrous nodule in the suprapatellar area can be present and dislodges from the femoral box with extension making clicks and some uh, problems in motion the second variety is a constrained unhinged type which is used in unstable knees with single ligament deficiency or severe deformity and revisions and in loose flexion cases consists of long tibial bust and deep femoral box supported by femoral and tibial stems to provide forced dissipation over a wide area with lessening of accepting loosening this provides stability in both valgus and varus uh, directions and also provides rotational stability but more bone is removed from the femoral box and during insertion of stem and aseptic loosening is anticipated the last type is a hinge knee in which the femoral and tibial parts are literally connected with a connection bar and locking bin so it can be used in severely unstable situations with multiple ligament deficiency or in hyperextension instability as in polio cases or defective posterior capsule and in highly commuted fractures and tumors with appropriate modular augments thank you so much